All right, good evening. Welcome to the Corny Museum of Glass. Yeah. All right. You know, 6 p.m. is always our late show here at the museum where we get a chance to demonstrate something that may take a little bit more time in regards to size or detail. And on Thursdays during the summer, it's part of our live stream demonstrations, and we take uh, a chance for our teachers teaching across the street at our public access studio. We invite them over here on the Thursdays to do a live stream demonstration. And this week, we have Martin Yaneski all the way from the Czech Republic. Yeah. Martin sculpts the human figure with extreme detail. Tonight he is making an arm and a hand out of an opaline glass, a nice um, soft white glass. Now Martin can't do it by himself. He's got a full team here helping him out right now on the bench with the pipe. We got Darren right behind Darren. We got like Emma. We've also, from our team here, we got Chris Rochelle, Heather Speedrack. We got Frederick. My name's Jared. I'm here to help talk you through the process. Yeah. I think we've got some of Martin's students up in the glassblower gallery. Sculpting glass uh, in this realistic form takes a lot of time. Utilizing a variety of torches to get some extreme detail. So Martin got started a little bit earlier to meet our time constraints here uh, with the opening and closing hours uh, here at the gallery, I mean at the museum. So for the mes rest of the demonstration, you'll see Martin high highly utilizing this torch, what we call the hot torch. It mixes gas and oxygen to create a flame at 3,000 degrees. This is a mid-range burner. We can adjust the gas and the oxygen to create a very small flame for pinpoint detail or a large area of heat and then we may also use the fluffy torch at about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and that will mostly get a broader spectrum of the heat. So uh, depending on what's needed at which stage, we'll be using a lot of those torches. So if you haven't seen a demonstration yet today at the museum, this is definitely a very unique one. I'll make sure to pinpoint uh, a lot of the uh, more specific uh, and generic details of glass making. Sculpting form is going to take a little bit longer uh, and a different pace than maybe if you came to one of our normal demonstrations today to see a blown form, right? A lot of the vessels and uh, blowing glass, it's sort of this process, this dance in which you start, you go throughout the song and finish it in a time uh, of about 20, 25 minutes for one of our two gather pieces. Uh, but this piece, and depending on the size and detail, could take hours uh, or a full workday uh, to create. Whenever you're working with a soda lime based glass like we work with here, it's a temperature sensitive glass. You have to keep a minimum temperature, at least 900 degrees, if not a little bit higher. So in between the sculpting and heating with the hot torch, we'll be flashing the entire object in our main reheating chamber, which Darren's going up to right now. This reheating chamber, called the glory hole, is at 2,120 degrees Fahrenheit. We could, of course, adjust the temperature, uh, but its main pur purpose is to keep the glass warm and get the glass hot. In regards to the sculpting process, we'll be utilizing the torch more uh, to pinpoint certain areas and rely less on the general heat of the reheating chamber. So this style of working is only something you can do with today's modern equipment with the torches, something glass blowers didn't have over 100 years ago um, that allows someone like Martin to create the work that he does. He'll be utilizing a variety of tools that are going to be made primarily out of steel, but we may use items that are made out of wood or cork. Metal is always going to take heat out of the glass faster. They're very good for taking hot glass, hitting it with cold steel. You create a really beautiful impression that as long as you don't overheat that, you'll maintain that throughout the, uh, the entirety of the piece. And that's how Martin is going to utilize definition uh, for the details of this hand and arm. But 
utilizing wood and cork, more organic substance. That's to take less heat out of the glass and use it for kind of broad shaping. Martin's uh, sculpting on a bubble, so this is a hollow form. Of course, it's a lot thicker. This at times will allow you to deflate the bubble, and if something is more deflated than you would like, you always have the possibility of blowing back through the pipe to expand the glass. Uh, it's more forgiving to sculpt on a bubble than it would be on a solid form of complete solid glass. One of the nice things about watching a show here at the museum, we got this great view of inside of our reheating chamber. And this is brought to us by utilizing a special type of glass called Fusilica, which was developed here in Corning in the 1930s. Uh, it has no other additives. It's pure silicone dioxide uh, that melts at a temperature of 3,800 degrees. And that's what protects our camera from the heat. This type of glass had no use for a number of decades until it made its way into the NASA program. It's the same type of glass they use on the space shuttle windows. Fused silica also makes up the base of fiber optic cables. It's the most optical pure type of glass here uh, on the Earth. Martin's able to cut into the form with a pair of straight shears. Just think of a heavy duty scissor, right? They're not sharp. The glass just has to be hot in order for us to cut it. So Martin is what we would call here at the museum the gaffer. That's the name, the term you give to the person who's in charge of the piece. Martin knows all the steps that are needed. And anything we create out of glass or any art form, right, everything has its own recipe. No matter how many times you've made it, that recipe is going to change. So you take on all your years of experience and knowledge and practice to apply it in the moment with the heat that you have. Soda lime glass melts, uh, before it forms a glass at 2300 degrees, we will scoop it up out of our furnace at 2120 degrees Fahrenheit, but primarily we work with glass between the temperature ranges of about 1800 degrees to 1400 degrees. And the glass will still be molten and moving upwards to that 900 degree mark, but much, much slower at that lower temperatures. During our normal demonstrations when we have uh, our blown forms, we're constantly keeping those in motion in order to achieve that round symmetrical shape. Uh, but in the sake of, of sculpting an object, uh, it's going to be more irregular and we'll be doing a lot of flipping to accommodate for the movement of the glass, but also give us a moment there in which the shape So our reheating chamber, we have a series of doors that we can open to accommodate a larger object, especially for a sculpted form like this. And uh, the doors are made of a high refractory castable. 
to withstand the heat. The inside of that uh, has insulated brick. And of course, our furnaces here on the stage are all powered by natural gas uh, mixed with forced air to create a really clean burning flame. For the first uh, 3,500 years, glass uh, ovens were all powered by the burning of wood until you got into the Industrial Revolution and they switched to coal. Now modern furnaces will utilize either propane or natural gas. Over here at the museum, we do have a, um, um, a stage powered by uh, electric elements. It's all electric stage. Utilizes a material uh, called molybdenum disilicide, heating elements to heat our ovens. So because we're live streaming the show, we also get a lot of questions from people viewing in uh, from anywhere in the world who are watching our show. So one of the questions we just got was, what is the most important tool to the glass blower? Now, the most common one is probably going to be the jacks. Those tools are actually right there at the hip uh, of Martin, right there to his right. And any glass store you go into, you're going to find those tools right there. We utilize those primarily in every piece we make in more ways than one. Uh, but your tools are only important for probably whatever you're making at that time. Of course, I'd probably say the most important one is always going to be heat, regardless. If you don't have heat, you're not able to make the glass. You're not able to do anything with the heat. As a beginner, that's your biggest struggle. Things are hot, they're moving around, and you get a little nervous, a little anxious. Once it cools and gets under control, you feel more comfortable, but you can't work with cold glass. There are a number of standard tools that uh, every glass blower is going to have. Your jacks, tweezers, straight shears, diamond shears. Uh, but once you start to formulate your own body of work, especially sculpting, uh, you might have specific tools made just for you. I, know, I think I saw one up there is actually just some sort of steak knife. That I think the serrated edge was grinded down that Martin is using. I've seen artists use forks. Uh, I know a lot of artists who like to go to antique stores and find old uh, kitchen or metal tools from a previous age to use either for texture uh, or any method or stage in glass making, bent screwdrivers. So we were mentioning earlier about our all-electric studio here. Um, and what's the difference or what would someone prefer between electric and gas? I would say every glass blower would always want a gas furnace for the most part. Uh, they're just going to get hotter. Uh, they stay hotter longer. They have more direct heat against your material. When you work at an electric furnace, it's a radiant heat. Um, the electric furnace, however, does utilize itself very well to uh, Venetian work, uh, blowing glass very thin because it's not going to overheat your glass too soon where you could uh, lose uh, dimensions or have a collapse on you. Uh, working in an electric furnace, it's a much slower process. Um, and it would not utilize itself well at all for this method here. Even if you had torches, the electric furnace, uh, just too slow. And it doesn't want to fire polish the cut marks. Right? See, Martin's removing a lot of material, cutting into the form. And those electric furnace doesn't want to quite really melt that away. It would still kind of leave that raised or pinched surface, whereas the gas will always smooth over everything. So here we go. Here's the jacks, which I was mentioning earlier. And each one of these tools no matter what, any part on them is going to have a certain shape, which is going to make a certain impression. So as Martin 
spent many, many years focusing and studying the form of the human uh, to incorporate here in this hand. I'm sure over time he's probably utilized and tried out many different tools to find just the right one to make just the right impression to achieve that specific spot on the form. And of course you have to store all of that in your mind to utilize during the piece. Right? You can't just stop, hang the piece up, think about it for a moment or uh, you know, check your notes. Now those jack blades that we use, they do have, um, we keep them coated, the blades coated in beeswax, which is on the corner of the, of the tool bench, because those type of tools, we do not want um, to have them when they're heated to stick to the outside of the glass. But our tweezers, what Martin's using right now, are shears, we don't want to get any wax on those tools. They're not going to work. They're not going to be able to grab the glass. They're going to slip right off. And so in order to grab, the glass to form some of these details here on the knuckles. Quick moment there to heat the tips of the blade of the tweezers. Not only is it going to heat them up to make them grab the glass easier, but it's going to help to allow them to um, burn off any of that wax. So a lot of glass blowers uh, today in the world, uh, most of us are finding glass in a university program. Um, there are about 48 accredited universities here in the US. So a lot of people are getting their Bachelor of Fine Arts four or five years studying glass uh, in that program. Not only here in the US, but also all over the world. Uh, programs exist in every, almost every country. Uh, Martin, though, uh, raised in the Czech Republic, started working in a studio at a much younger age. Some glass blowers here in Corning um, have gotten their start when the Stuben Crystal Factory was right in the room in which we're sitting. They closed down in 2010, but they had an apprenticeship program that was six years or 10,000 hours. And at that point, you could sit down at the bench to practice one of the pieces in their catalog. And if you could make that, and th you had three attempts, if you could successfully make a first product that's a sellable product, then you could be the gaffer. And at that point, the, the other workers on the floor would call you a good beginner. Um, so that's six years of daily dedication. And there's nothing really in our daily life to prepare you uh, for working with glass. Being a lot like learning a musical instrument or a second language, right? It depends on how much work you're putting in on a daily basis, determine how good you're going to get with that material. Uh, and especially with glass, you know, it's not something you can just do in your bedroom or in your basement. 
And so it takes a lot of dedication, a lot of daily practice, um, just to make something simple, like a drinking glass. So this is not something you'd probably be attempting um, at the end of your studies. So you kind of notice the pace that's happening up here on the stage, the time that's needed to work on the hand, but then we had to get it back there to the reheating chamber for the, for the flash. With a form you already like a drawing, you want to establish the main shapes before you work your way into the detail. So here with sculpted glass, you wouldn't want to put any of the fine uh, details of the hand in if you hadn't got the overall shape because it would take more heat to get back there into the core of the glass uh, to get the object moving. And of course, every time we work with color, each color comes from different types of metals, metal oxides, and they start to affect the glass and its workability. So if you ever try out something new, you always want to try it out in clear, which you could kind of assume is our neutral base for all glass. Um, this opaline, I believe, uses either uh, fluorine as one of the additives uh, to make up the color. make this softer white. Yeah, milk glass, yeah, if you've heard of that term, milk glass, definitely uh, a marketing uh, for that look, just like if you've heard of um, Carnival glass, depression glass. These are all just terms for where an item has kind of come from or the time. Um, that was something interesting in our collection. There's some glass in the American section, um, and it has a beautiful kind of ruby to pink fade. And even in the middle 1800s, you know, they called that peach glass. So these are just kind of terms from the seller uh, to help to create some appeal for their, for their items. So when we start to work glass like this, glass that's a little bit bigger than your average size, um, you start to add some elements and factors here. One is going to be the heat. That's just something, right, you're here, you're watching us make this, but that's not something that you're experiencing or feeling um, from just being this little bit of distance away from the workbench. You know, anytime we're getting close to that glass, it's somewhere always around 1400 degrees or higher you're definitely going to feel the radiant heat. You can see Martin has a glove on his right hand. We get that question a lot in our shows if we ever wear gloves. For this case, for sculpting, getting real close to the glass, you're going to want some kind of glove to add some protection. You're moving around so fast, you've got to keep the hand moving. Uh, you don't have a chance for maybe someone to come in there with a wood board uh, to help shield you. And then weight also becomes a big factor as well, especially early on in the process uh, when this piece was a little bit more fluid and for us to establish the bubble and move the piece around. Making a larger object, you're going to need a larger blowpipe to support the glass. We're utilizing stainless steel nowadays, which is a poor conductor of heat. That's what allows us to, for the most part, grab up pretty high in order to control the glass. But if you have more glass, have more weight, you're gonna need a larger uh, diameter blowpipe. So that blowpipe itself is probably somewhere around 12 plus pounds. 
And it looks like that was probably a three, maybe four gather piece of glass. We probably have another 12 pounds. But of course, that 12 pounds isn't something you're just holding in your center of gravity. It's five feet away from you. Um, so that always adds a challenge. So you can see we got Darren is always right there standing behind on backing up the pipe, especially as Martin has to lean out to work on the form. It can be difficult to help to balance that weight by just pressing down from so far with your left hand and also to help kind of turn and rotate the material to make it easier. There's not much you can do with glass just working by yourself unless you put in the time and arrange your studio. Um, you might be able to make things by yourself, but you're limited by size. So it's not uncommon to see a team when things start to get bigger and more involved. Does anybody have any questions out there? So we spent a lot of time working there on the on the on the hand and the fingers. We're utilizing a lot of heat on there. We have we do have to be mindful of that glass that's on our blowpipe. That's holding it on there, right? We have to keep that minimum temperature. So that's where we really utilize that fluffy torch in between these flash sheets. As we go into our reheating chamber, it's a general overall heat, but notice the hand, right? It's in first, it's out last, it goes in the deepest into the oven, it's exposed to the hottest part for the longest amount of time. Whereas that little bit on the blowpipe is in the shallow, colder spot um, of our reheating chamber. So Martin uh, doesn't just do hands and arms. He also uh, works on uh, faces or busts. And we have one right here he just did just the other day, which I'm going to go ahead and hold up so you can see the detail and expertise here in this form. And this is a little bit different. Martin's just sculpting from the outside for the arm and the hand at the moment. But to make this head, he utilizes inside sculpting where the form uh, tools are inserted inside and pushed sometimes up and out. Here we go. Um, got a nice close up here for the live stream. And maybe, there we go. You can also see it there on the, uh, the televisions. So that's a totally different uh, form for the head, the inside sculpting, utilizing these hooked metal tools with um, different shapes on the end of them. Imagine a, a walking cane and on the, the handle part, cutting that short and then putting different shapes to um, be able to push the glass out. And you can follow Martin on social media, on Instagram, and see a lot of the things he's doing on a daily basis. So Martin makes his way across the world to a lot of studios teaching classes, 
Uh, he also has a, a studio in Alaska where he owns and works to make his, uh, make his art. Uh, so he's working every week of the year. So if you follow him, you'll be able to always see something new. So right now, Martin, like I said, he's teaching a two-week class across the street in our public access studio. Maybe some of you went over there today to take part in our Make Your Own experience, uh, which if you haven't done that today and you're here in the area tomorrow, you can go by. You can actually work with one of our skilled glass makers to make something uh, out of glass. But we offer classes from beginning to advanced classes like the class Martin's teaching year-round. Uh, we also offer residency programs for artists to come here for a month at a time uh, to create their work. And we offer all the assistance and all the equipment, uh, materials that are needed. Uh, working out of glass is not a cheap art form. It's not just the materials, it's all the years you have to invest. Um, and assistance as well, if you want to make amazing things, you're going to need the best assistance. And they're going to get, want to be paid well, too. So now we're shifting into some of the finer details. Right. So we got a question about the raw costs of our material. Uh, here in our studio, our clear glass, we buy it in a cullet form. So it's already been melted down once, and it comes in a 50-pound bag, and they look like little ice cubes when we get it. I believe we got the cullet for maybe a dollar twenty a pound. Now, all of our colored glass, for the most part, we buy from a company in Germany. We get it by the kilo. That's 2.2 .2 pounds. And depending on the type of color, it could be 30 to 85 US for that kilo or 2.2 .2 pounds. But color can be stretched a lot farther. You know, all these uh, objects you see here at the floor made on the hot glass show stage, color, for the most part, might only make up 3 to 5% of the overall mass of the object. So color can be very deceiving. Um, and some of the colors get very expensive because we use precious metals like silver and gold to create them. If you see a nice beautiful pink, some blues, some really precise amber tones come from the, the gold, the gold chloride. This opaline glass we're using, um, we actually melt it down in a furnace ourselves. Even down here we have a little color furnace in the corner. Right now we have a green glass there. This opaline glass is actually melted across the street in the studio. 
And before our live stream started, they gathered up all the glass, put the bubble in over there, and then when they had the heat they needed, we walked it across the parking lot over here. I think it was well documented. So while the materials might not be expensive, the most expensive thing is to melt the glass and keep it melted. So most studios, you're just going to have your one furnace with the clear or colorless glass, and you can add any color you want to the outside because the furnace is always the most expensive piece of equipment in any studio. And it's not something you can turn off at the end of the night. But depending on the size of the furnace, it might take anywhere from three to seven or ten days for it to heat up and or cool down. It also depends on the quality of the crucible pot that's holding the glass, how much you want to take care of that. Here we have a 900-pound furnace, and um, it's been on since February of 2015, and I don't believe we're turning it off until February of 2025, which is pretty awesome. The reheating chamber is powered by gas. We turn those off at night, and they only take 45 to 60 minutes to come up from room temperature to our 2100 degree working heat. So this studio down here uh, opened up with the brand new contemporary wing that sits right behind us in early 2015. And our goal in creating this studio here in the old Stuben factory uh, layout was to create the best hot shop in the world. So you are witnessing uh, this space. And this is also the biggest auditorium or seated viewing space for watching glass blowing in the world as well. And you're work watching a world-class artist at the same time. So you're in a special space, witnessing a special event during a certain special time in life called the glass age, which we're currently living in. Everything we do is dictated by glass. The devices we use with their gorilla glass on the screen to send information through small glass fiber optic cables halfway across the world in instantaneous speed. And all that glass technology was all created in one space. That's right here in Corner, New York. Think about that. Now, my favorite thing about the studio here in the amphitheater is uh, here on the ground, you might see this little silver strip with these little yellow sides. That's our air conditioning unit. Most hot shops are like they sound. They're pretty hot. In fact, depending on where you're at in the world, sometimes your studio, you might have to close down for a number of months when it comes to the hot season, especially in your humid uh, areas of the world. Um, it becomes just too safe. Uh, too unsafe to work under those conditions. You know, uh, the biggest danger, you know, you see we're working with a lot of heat, um, but uh, the biggest danger for any glass blower is always going to be heat exhaustion or dehydration. Uh, so you want to stay hydrated, replenish your electrolytes. Of course, you're not going to have a problem here with our air conditioned units. Very spoiled here at the museum. We like it that way. And so we made sure that we could accommodate any artist here at our museum. Uh, we got a variety of equipment even behind the studio that we can pull out when need be. We're not even working in our largest reheating chamber. You can see the cold one behind the bench against the wall over there in which I could comfortably lay down in. It has four sets of doors. And we could probably could make an armor hand that was three times the size out of that hole.
So great team synergy happening here on the stage. Everyone's aware of uh, the duties that are needed in order to make sure that this piece succeeds. You can see this isn't, you know, just something, uh, this is a marathon uh, style of a piece here. You know, I think one of the hardest things uh, for any glass artist when you're working with the material is being able to understand proportion and size. You know, people stop and really measure things. Uh, you work with the glass in such a kind of weird angle, you're always kind of looking at it from a downward and it's always in motion. Uh, and there's always little things about having the, uh, the right setup preparations in terms of tools or in case for this situation, having enough material, knowing that you're going to remove it to get just the right size that you need. All right? Whenever you're blowing glass, you can always blow it bigger, stretch it farther. You can always uh, remove items, but you can never really add them on. When we pull the glass out at 2,150 degrees Fahrenheit, it's just like room temperature honey. And as it cools, it becomes a solid. Depending on uh, the mass of material you have, um, or the heat you have, that change from being something that is extremely soft, that requires minimal pressure, to something that starts to cool, require more force, can change over the course of a minute to just a few seconds. So understanding how to build up the heat into the material to achieve the certain shape you want is also one of the other really difficult aspects of working with glass, especially sculpting. In some situations, it's not just about hitting it with the torch and touching it. You might want to build up the heat through torches and flashings. Are you trying to get the glass hot to the core, or do you just need the surface to be hot for a detail? Now this live streamed event will be accessible from our YouTube channel um, or going to the Corning Museum of Glass homepage. And we keep a stockpile of past live streams and other special demonstrations that happen here at the museum. Every Sunday we do a program called You Design It, We Make It. There's a little section here at the museum where our young visitors can do drawings. And every week we pick a drawing and make it out of glass. So you can watch a lot of those there as well.
So here we go. We got that torch turned down a little bit to better direct the heat.
So I want to chime back in now. We had a nice moment there to just really get to watch Martin work for a second. It's kind of a soothing process. I really enjoy sculpting when I get the chance to do it. I like the pace that's involved. And you see the time that it's involved, especially if you're a student wanting to learn the process to have that time. Uh, that's why it's really important for us that we offer our programs, our classes across the street. We also offer a variety of scholarships um, for students. So that they can afford the time to come by here to the museum to get the time to practice uh, to go through all these steps. And so that's a really important thing when you're starting out as a glass blower. Especially if you're going through a university-based program, you get exposed to all the techniques and what can be done with glass, but after four years, you really, really haven't built up much skill unless you were really focused in one specific area. And you might not know where your focus wants to be, right? You could focus on making Venetian work. You could focus on sculpting, but maybe you don't want to do the human form. Maybe you want to make animals or abstract sculptures. So this is another special year here at the museum. This marks the 150th anniversary of glass making coming to Corning. The Corning Glass Works originated in Brooklyn and was called the Brooklyn Flint Glass Works. And when they moved 150 years ago here to Corning, they changed their name to the Corning Glass Works. Of course, that's how we get the Corning Museum of Glass, which was founded in 1951. Uh, but to help celebrate this 150th anniversary uh, we have our glass barge that's launched. So we have a, a barge with the all-electric studio traveling along the New York Erie Canal. It's halfway through its journey, more than halfway through its journey, following the same path that the glass works utilized, going up the Hudson to the Erie Canal, down Lake Seneca, here to the Chemung River and the shores of Corning. What's that? Oh yeah, the camera that's in the oven, yeah. That is brought to us, uh, the camera's actually behind the oven. We talked about this earlier, but might as well chime in again. Uh, yeah, amazing shot that we have here inside of our reheating chamber. The camera's outside of the furnace, but it's protected um, by a special piece of glass called fused silica, developed here in the 1934. It's the same type of glass they use on the space shuttle windows. Which is really nice if you're working down here in the shop. Uh, you get a chance to look up. You can look at your piece and see how it's heating in there. For certain situations, that might be important. If you're making something very long, you have a soft color in the top, and you don't want to overheat it and lose control of it, have it crinkle on you. You can always watch that screen to make sure you know when you need to come out.
Yeah, the temperature of the reheating chamber is probably somewhere around 2,100, 2,120 degrees Fahrenheit at the moment. Of course, our reheating chambers here, we have a digital controller. We can put in a very specific temperature. And sometimes you might want the glass, uh, the furnace to be a little bit warmer when you're trying to melt in color. If you're working in a fret form, trying to melt away detail, or if you need to turn the hole down to not overheat the glass, you can also do so. And now, depending on the equipment, when you open the doors, you're going to begin to lose heat. Uh, this reheating chamber here, just leaving the front doors open, it does a pretty good job maintaining its heat. And so it's really important to make sure you have someone there who can help to work the doors. And if you don't have a big enough team for the object you're making, and you're opening the doors, you're leaving them open, you're losing heat, it might take a little bit longer to build that heat back up. You know, not every studio is created equal. And most glass blowers don't usually typically have their own glass studio. We tend to congregate in areas where there are public access studios where we can rent time from, and you also have other assistants to help you. And each one is very different. The equipment, the type of gas they're using, just even the benches, either the height or dimensions of all that can be very different. Uh, so if you have a big project and you're going to work in a brand new studio, you might want to practice something else first just to get a little more comfortable uh, with your surroundings. And even though we, uh, we're working with soda lime glass, there are different manufacturers who produce soda lime glass, and each one is going to be a little bit different. And depending on how many times that glass has been melted down will also change the properties of the glass. Our glass here at the museum, like I mentioned earlier, we are melting the cullet. Once you uh, melt down glass a second time, you slowly burn away the flux, which is soda ash. So this uh, opaline glass melted over at our studio, utilize this spruce pine batch, which comes from spruce pine, North Carolina. We get the glass in its raw form and have to melt it down into glass, cook it at 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. But of course, when you uh, first melt down the material, it's much softer and has a little bit more working time. And subtle differences in uh, the manufacturing of soda lime glass, like I said, can change its properties. When Stu Ben Crystal was here, they were working with a leaded glass. Lead glass came around during the Industrial Revolution. Once wood was no longer uh, available to mount the furnaces, so you had to switch to coal. Coal was less efficient. Glass blowers had to find a way to lower the melting temperature of glass yet again in order to make it more. Uh, easier to uh, burn with burning coal. And so George Ravencroft of England uh, was the first to develop lead crystal, and which you use lead oxide as the melting flux. With soda lime glass, soda ash is the flux. It uses about 20% of the mixture. But with leaded glass, I believe it's somewhere around 33% um, of the lead oxide is of the flux makes up the glass. Now when you melt lead into glass, you change its properties in many ways. Um, one, lower melting temperature. Two, the glass becomes more brilliant once it's cooled. It has a higher refraction, uh, ref, uh, refraction of light. It's also softer to grind away. So here in Corning, the Crystal City, um, all those glass companies that were able to make the cut crystal bowls like the one I'm holding in my hand much easier to grind away and polish a leaded glass than a soda lime glass. 
And of course, with lead, it's going to be a little bit more physically heavy. You don't get as many studios that may want to melt a uh, leaded glass. They can use barium now as the flux. Even though whenever you melt down any metal with glass, it bonds to the form. It's not going to leach out. I think with any uh, environmental issues with um, melting lead is mostly with the waste that's left over, the cost um, for disposing of it properly but no issues once it's melted down with the material. So any of the metals that are used to create any of these colors, melt it down, it's bonded with the glass. There are tens of thousands of different types of glass out there in the world. If you add boron as the flux, then you get Pyrex cookware, which is also borosilica glass. It's another style of working called flame working or torch working, lamp working. Very similar names for the same process. That glass melts at a much higher temperature, I believe 2700 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can work with it on a little torch. We also offer flame classes uh, across the street at the studio. So we had a, actually a nice question uh, online. Someone was asking, if, can you ever burn the glass? Uh, and you can. You can overheat uh, the surface and disrupt the, the molecular structure, especially utilizing that hot torch. Uh, you do have to be careful depending on uh, the type of glass you're using and how hot that torch is and the mixture. Uh, you can bubble the surface, especially when you have color. You change the chemistry quite a lot. One of the more harder colors to create is a red glass. That's a very easy color to burn, especially in a gas-powered furnace. And that's actually one of the nice things about our electric furnace here that uh, I want to get back to a question earlier. The electric equipment utilizes itself really well for making anything with color and not disturbing it due, one, to the temperature, the heat, and two, the lack of having combustion inside. So you don't change the chemistry uh, of that mixture. Yeah, uh, another question on the science side uh, in regards to um, compatibility, which just become an issue. For instance, we have spectrum soda lime glass here at the museum and across the street at the studio, they melt this uh, spruce pine soda lime glass and those two, even though they're both soda lime, are not compatible. They would melt together while they were hot. You'd be able to make something, but once the glass cools, to room temperature, it would uh, crack and break. And so you do have to be concerned whenever you use color, if it's compatible with your base clear glass. For the most part today, we have about three color manufacturers in the world, two in Germany, one in New Zealand, which I believe is actually gonna be moving to Seattle, Washington soon, called Gaffer Glass. Uh, but they make all of their colors to be compatible with, with a COE of 96. And that's what our soda lime glass that we use in glass studios also has a similar uh, rate of expansion or a similar COE. Before that, a lot of other glass companies were around. You would have to do a compatibility test to test out a new color with your clear batch. You would get a little gather of clear. You put the color on the one end and you pull it as a very thin strand like a fiber optic cable. And if, if, as it cools, if it stays straight, it's compatible. But if it bends or curves, it would be incompatible. So here's the cork paddle.
you may see artists use two of these to help to squeeze a bubble into a more oval form. And of course, because the organic substance being more gentle on the glass, you're able to push down without shocking the surface. Is there a is this a gender specific hand or is it gender neutral? I don't know. Martin, they want to know if this is a male or a female hand or is it gender neutral? Yeah. Yeah. Um they are both made out openly. I don't know if this is going to be an uh, installation, if he's going to have these hands be shown with the figure. It might just be separate. Yeah. Uh, I know sometimes Martin does make some smaller figures that are complete. Or that was part of his earlier body, body of work. And he, uh, he does a, different, a few varieties. If you get a chance, uh, you can Google him. Like I said, get onto his Instagram feed, and you can uh, look at the different styles in which he works. Is, is a few different bodies of work. So depending on where he wants to move those fingers depends on where he needs to apply that heat in order for that glass to bend the way he wants it to.
So really good skilled team down here. You notice a nice kind of flow, a nice smooth pace. And this isn't something that just happens. I encourage everyone to visit a beginning workshop. It's a much different experience. In fact, you'll never see me in a beginning class. It frightens me to death. Since there's nothing to compare with uh, in our daily lives to working with glass, it's, it's very awkward at first to make your way around a studio uh, to know the movements that are needed to handle the material uh, and to feel comfortable in any new way of working. And so, you know, you have to work through all those steps and put in the time. So even here, having all the tools, having everything arranged just right, knowing where to find them, um, and working around the glass, working around the heat. Not just as the person who's making the piece, as the artist, but also uh, as an assistant as well, knowing your place and your role, um, and making sure you know you don't burn someone. That's always important. Yeah. What's that? Can we put the piece in the oven and come back to it? The quick answer to that is yes, but it depends on the type of equipment you have and the stage at which that piece is in. We could put any of this glass into an oven and have it sit at 900 degrees where it's perfectly still and stable, um, and then we can reheat it, get it hot again to pick it up. The biggest danger, of course, is taking it from, say, that black box that's kind of behind uh, Martin or one of these, uh, this garage over here. These are some of our temporary holding ovens. It's that moment from taking it out of there to the reheating chamber when the glass is gonna be in its most fragile state. We don't wanna overheat it in one of these ovens and have it starting to move or slump or lose its shape before we're able to pick it up and pull it out. If you're gonna pick it back up, you gotta make sure you have a connection that's gonna be strong enough to fuse to it so you don't lose control of it, but you don't want to pull it out too hot and not be able to control the object. If Martin wanted to, if he was making a smaller figure, he could make each part. He could make the hands, the arms, the head, torso, all those components, separate days over the course of a month, um, and then later reheat all of them together and pick them up. It just depends a lot for the size uh, and the thickness. Something like um, kind of finer detail would be one of the more harder things. Uh, very thin points on a sculpture would be some fragile areas. But I don't think you would want to have a piece that's halfway complete and pick it back up to try to work on it. Like I said, you can make the parts and later pick up all the parts again. Um, but to get a piece too cold and have to reheat it, you might start to warp some of your detail in the work that you already completed uh, in the piece to begin with. So traditionally, right, a glass artist sitting at the workbench working on their piece, but as uh, 
equipment has modernized and gotten more sophisticated and we're able to accommodate larger objects and utilize torches to keep these larger objects hot, hot. You're gonna find situations like this where you have the glass artist working outside the bench, which is probably something you probably weren't gonna find over 100 years ago. And it's all about you know, accessibility to the object. And of course, a lot of these changes and new styles have come around because of the studio glass movement, which started in Toledo, Ohio, 1962. Yeah. Right, we're using soda lime glass, which is a really common type of glass, very affordable to make. And it uh, allows the glass to melt a lower temperature and stay hot. And our soda lime glass is formulated uh, to be worked in this artistic manner. And you can formulate soda lime glass to go through uh, a machine to make a bottle. And that type of glass is made to get very fluid at a hot temperature, but it needs to hit the mold, form a bottle in a matter of a, a second, and then move down the assembly line without slumping or moving, right? If our soda lime glass was in uh, a machine and being utilized to make beer bottles, they would all slump and lose their shape because they just hold their heat a little bit longer. And of course, you know, you could collect a bunch of bottles and melt them down to work with them, but it would be very difficult. It just gets too cold too fast. Um, and you'd also have to be worried about m the compatibility. If you're gonna collect brown bottles, you'd make sure they're all the same type of brown bottle from the same company or product. So even though glass blowing has been around for a little over 2,000 years, you go back 100 years ago, you don't know many of the glass blowers. You're very familiar with designers, names like Frederick Carter, Stu Ben, Rene Lalique of France, um, or Tiffany. But all of those designers had a factory with many glass blowers who were the master craftsmen that were able to execute those designs. But it wasn't in, so I said like the studio glass movement in 1962, um, where now the designer is also the artist and you're working on a smaller scale and you're pushing outside of a large factory into a small studio. And so that was uh, Harvey Littleton and Dominic Labino, ceramist and a chemist. They held that first workshop. They milled 50 pound of marbles. That launched a program in uh, a college in Madison, Wisconsin, in which you had someone by the name of Dale Chihuly who attended that. So small spot heating going right now for that very specific detail, the fingernails. And utilizing the backhand side of the underside of uh, a pair of tweezers to create that shape.
Yeah.
All right. Yeah, so if, you, uh, if you're on the live stream and you're watching, you tuned in. We got Martin Yuneski here. He's in the, uh, well into the process of sculpting this hand and arm. And it was all from one piece of glass. There's no added components. In order to get the best, most realistic feel, we're sculpting this completely from one bubble. And so when that was sculpted, the, the top of the hand was a, a big pad, like a very big mitten. And each finger was cut in with a pair of straight shears and slowly and meticulously shaped with a variety of tools in the torch to get all this supreme detail.
endurance. Highly needed. Maintain the heat in the bubble and to have this focus and have the team and the resources to accomplish this is not an easy feat.
So we're approaching the closing of the museum, and I know Martin is finished with the, the hand portion, and normally he would take this sculpture, he would add a punty, which is a secondary handle, which would probably go on the back of the hand, and this would allow us to hold on to it but break it free from the blowpipe so he can better scarp, sculpt the forearm, which he plans to do at a later date. And what we can do with this glass is we can completely anneal it. That's the slow cooling process. And he'll be able to reheat it slowly, pick it back up, and sculpt to finish the, the forearm, which is great because I know someone had that question a little bit earlier, um, if that was a possibility. And so in this situation, uh, he's going to go about doing that. The kneeling process, uh, the slow cooling, is always based on the thickness of the material and not so much its size. And so we have on either side of the stage our, kneel our kneelers, our kneeling ovens, these big black boxes. And around holding at 900 degrees, well this piece will slowly cool. Probably over about 16 hours, maybe 24 for this piece. So adding a little bit of extra heat there to that initial score mark that was squeezed in with the jacks at the beginning of the process. We don't want to break it away too cold. Chris Rochelle putting on some Kevlar gloves and a protective sh suit and face shield so he's able to calmly place the arm into the oven. So redefining that score mark. Utilize the torch here to keep the hand warm as we let that jack line cool down a little bit. And we'll do our best to uh, flash this piece down Try to create an even temperature throughout the material, somewhere around 1,000 degrees. We'll use these shears to really cut in further and really cool that score line. And for the most part, we'll need a little bit of water for a thermal shock. And it just takes a tap to break free at the weak point. Yeah. So we'll place it. And to the oven, let's have another round of applause for Martin Yaneski. And an outstanding sculpture.